Hello everyone, in this video we'll be solving a floor function equation. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button, also comment and subscribe, and let's get started. So we do have the floor value of x squared minus 4 times the floor value of x plus 3 is equal to 0, and we're going to be solving four values of x here. Okay, first of all, notice that this problem does not have any negative solutions. Why is that? Because if you isolate the floor value of x squared, you're going to notice something interesting here, which is going to equal 4 times the floor value of x minus 3. So if x is actually less than 0, 4 times the floor value of x is go going to be ne negative. And then the right-hand side is going to be negative when the left-hand side is positive. Therefore, we're not going to have any negative solutions. Is x equals 0 a solution? Nope, it's not a solution either. So let's remember the definition of the floor function, first of all, before we get started with the solution. Well, the floor value of any number a is defined as the greatest integer less than or equal to a. So in other words, you're basically rounding down the number. So if I have the floor value of 3.14, which is close to pi, sort of, you know, you're going to get 3. But on the other hand, if you are Taking the floor value of negative 3.14, then it should be negative 4 because you're always rounding it down. Okay, cool. So now, how do we solve this equation? Obviously, that kind of looks like, if I didn't have the floor function, it would look like x squared minus 4x plus 3 equals 0, and it will be factorable, right? This is a factorable trinomial. But unfortunately, we can't always say that the floor value of x squared is the same as, as the floor value of x quantity squared. Okay, cool. What are we going to do? We're going to use substitution here, obviously, right? Since we know that solutions are all positive, that also gives us an idea, uh, some boundaries about the solutions. So let's go ahead and start by calling this n. Floor value of x is equal to n. So what does that entail? Let's go ahead and write it down. Now, as you know, if you set the floor value of something equals to n, that means that x needs to be between n and n plus 1. Of course, x can equal n. And by the way, n is an integer here. So if you have a number whose floor value is 5, let's say, that means that that number can be 5 or greater than 5, but less than 6, right? Okay, so this is what it means. And this is basically pretty much all we need to solve floor value equations. Of course, there's some other manipulations that we have to do, but this is the gist of that. Cool. Now, after making this substitution, what am I going to get? Obviously, I can isolate my floor value of x squared again, and this is going to give me 4 times the floor value of x plus, I mean, minus 3, and we call this n. So what that means is basically, we can just go ahead and write it down here one more time. This is equal to n, so the floor value of x squared is going to be 4n minus 3. Now, what is that supposed to mean? Well, the equation that we used here, we can you know, the equation that we turn into an inequality, we can do it again. If the floor value of x squared is equal to 4n minus 3, n being an integer, of course, n, if n is an integer, 4n minus 3 is also an integer. Okay, cool. Now, you can also see that from here, n needs to be, you know, greater than a certain value, but let's not get into that right now. Okay, let's not spoil the surprise. So anyways, so this gives us, to let me rewrite it, the floor value of x squared is equal to 4n minus 3, and this implies that x squared is between 4n minus 3 and 4n minus 3 plus 1, which is 4n minus 2. As you know, if you know that the floor value of something equals an integer, then that expression inside the floor uh, function needs to be between those two consecutive integers, right? Okay, half closed interval, sort of. So now, we do have two results. We said that, okay, floor value of x is equal to n, which implied this one, and then we got this one from x squared. So let's go ahead and write those together because actually it's going to be much more meaningful if you put it all together. So now, you basically have, you basically have a system of inequalities. Our goal is to solve for x, but n is an integer, we know that. So we got to find the appropriate values for n so that we can solve for x. That's pretty much what the plan is. Okay, now, this, how it turns out to be is very interesting because we start off with a basic equation, which is floor function, and then it just turns into 
a bunch of inequalities. Okay, which is what makes, I think, these uh, functions interesting. All right, cool. Now, in order to be able to solve this inequality, what I'd like to do is, and I know that x is going to be positive, what I'd like to do is, I'm going to go ahead and square both sides of this inequality. Let me go ahead and do that. So what is that going to give me? Well, it's going to give me x squared between n squared and n plus 1 squared. Because think about it, like if x is between 3 and 5, obviously when you square it, its square is going to, not 3 and 5, 3, or 4, 3 and 4 maybe. When you square it, its square is going to be between 9 and 16. That makes sense, right? I mean, it makes sense. You can test it with numbers, so on and so forth. But now, here's what's significant about this. Now we got two inequalities and they both have x squared. That's what's nice about this. Now, now I can go ahead and work it out. But how do you solve a system of inequalities? Well, solving a system of inequalities that it's not that easy as solving a system of equations because you don't have equations, you have inequalities. But here's one thing we can do. Knowing that n is an integer will help. And also we have the same x squared in the middle. So here's what I'd like to do. Of course, there's other ways to solve this problem. Definitely, I respect that, but here's my approach. Okay, now, since x squared is greater than or equal to something here and less than or equal to something here, this is kind of like an upper bound, and that's like a lower bound for x squared, which means that the lower bound, of course, is always going to be less than the upper bound. Of course, we also have to consider the fact that these are consecutive integers, and they're going to go from one integer to the other. So we can safely say that as a conclusion here, or as a, uh, what should I say, consequence of these two inequalities, 4n minus 3 needs to be less than n plus 1 quantity squared. Alrighty, cool. That's one result we get. The second result we'll get is going to come from here and here. Since n squared is a lower bound and 4n minus 2 is an upper bound, I can safely say that n squared needs to be less than 4n minus 2. Now, here's a good question. Can they be equal, right? I mean, that's a legitimate question, isn't it? Well, they can't. For example, if you look at the bottom inequality, if they're equal, then n is not an integer, obviously. There are no integer solutions for that quadratic equation. What about the top one? We can test it out. Let's go ahead and test it out just for fun. 4n minus 3. What happens if they're equal? n squared plus 2n plus 1. Let's see what happens here. I'm going to bring the 4n over here, so it's going to become 2n. If I bring the negative 3 over, I'm going to get a 4. And as you know, this doesn't have integer solutions either. Forget about integers, let alone integers. It doesn't have real solutions for reals. Okay, cool. Now, how do we proceed? Well, we know that at least uh, it's a strict inequality, and we're just going to solve this easily. Why? Well, we already noticed that if you look at the first one, okay, so what am I, what do I mean by first one? This is, let this be the first one, and let this be the second one. In the first inequality, if you look at the first one, let's go ahead and expand it again. n squared plus 2n plus 1 is greater than 4n minus 3. Again, let's put everything on the same side. n squared minus 2n plus 4 is greater than 0. Now, this is a quadratic whose discriminant is positive, always. What is that supposed to mean? Well, did I say discriminant is positive? Okay, I'm sorry. Take it back. The discriminant is negative, which means that this quadratic is, when graphed, it's above the x-axis, which means that it doesn't have any real rules, which means that it's always, always going to be positive. Therefore, n can be anything here. There are no restrictions. There are no integers for which this is false. Make sense? So this, is a, this doesn't really help. So we're going to go with the second one. Well, it kind of helps because we don't have to worry about it. Okay. Anyways, let's take a look at the second inequality. How do you solve it? Put everything on the same side. Well, maybe not. Okay. How about this? Let's do it in a cool way. So let's leave the constant there and then let's add four to both sides because I want to turn this into a perfect square. All right. Add 4 to both sides. The reason why we add 4 is because half of 4 squared. That's how we kind of make it perfect square. And when you add 4, negative 2 plus 4 is going to be positive 2. And I can write this as n minus 2 quantity squared is less than 2. As you know, we can take the square root. It's going to become the absolute value. And then we can just solve this as a two-way inequality. How do you solve it? Well, if you just Go ahead and expand it. It's going to be between. It's going to be between these two numbers, negative root two and positive root two. And if you add two to both sides, then you should be getting something like this. So since the first inequality did not really give us anything 
you know, tangible or, I don't know, meaty, uh, this is going to give us something, hopefully, right? Well, as you see, the n values are restricted here, but one thing that you should never forget, n is an integer. It's not a real number. Well, it is a real number, but you know what I'm talking about, right? So it's an integer. So 2 minus root 2 is a little less than 2, right? Well, it's kind of like 2, 0.6 maybe. Okay, so we're talking about something greater than 0.6 and something less than 3.4-ish maybe. Okay, so what are some possible integers in that interval? Well, I do notice that n can be 1, 2, or 3. Great. So we have three possible values for n. What am I going to do with those values? I'm going to go ahead and plug them in into each one of these inequalities. And obviously, not into each one of these because I got to go back and check these ones, right? Because that's this is what I need. I need to associate x and n values. So what I'd like to do is I will actually like to go ahead and, you know, kind of cut this, right? And I want to be able to, you know, bring it over here. Let me do the following. Uh oh, refuses to move, huh? Okay, cool. Now, so what we're going to do with these inequalities is that look at the n values that we got. So we got n equals 1, 2, 3. And what we're going to do next is basically uh, we're going to plug those in. Okay, great. And now from here, hopefully we should have some solutions. So what happens if n equals 1? We're going to look at each case separately. If n is equal to 1, the first inequality is going to give me 1 and 2. These are consecutive numbers, remember? And both of these inequalities have to be true at the same time, by the way. So that's an and. Uh, this, the second one, gives me x squared needs to be between 1 and 2 squared. i got to be careful here because that's a 4. Now, when you look at the intersection of these inequalities, basically the intersection is the first one. Therefore, x squared needs to be between 1 and 2. But remember, x needs to be positive. And this implies that x needs to be between 1 and root 2. Awesome. So this is basically one of the results that I'm getting from here. So let me go ahead and circle that with a nice color. And now I'm going to look at the next possibility, n equals 2 now. What happens if n is equal to 2? Well, if n is equal to 2, then I should be getting something like 4 times 2 is 8 minus 3 is 5. So x squared is going to be between 5 and 6, right? And what is that going to give me if x is positive? x needs to be between root 5 and root 6. But notice that our interval is half closed. So this is going to be part of my solution, right? Okay, cool. Now, what's next? Well, n equals 3 is the last n value that I'm going to be looking at. And if I plug in 3, I should be getting 4 times 3 minus 3, which is 9. So x squared is going to be between 9 and 10, right? But again, half closed, right? And then from here, I should be able to take square roots both sides, but x is positive. Therefore, x needs to be between 3 and root 10. And this basically concludes the solution and brings us to the end of this video. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you tomorrow with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.